I'm starting a brand new teaching series today called Hurt. And every single one of us, whether you're seated here in the room or at one of our locations watching online, like, hey, every one of us has been hurt. Some, some ways that we would say are small, some ways that we say are, are deep and wounding. Every one of us has scars. Every single person listening to me has been hurt. And all week long, I just kept having like this visual image. And the idea that we begin life as a mirror and uh, clean and crack free, and then things happen, right? Someone says something to us that cracks us a little bit. Someone says, hey, uh, you, you don't belong here or rejects us in some way, says, I don't love you anymore. Someone cheats on us or lies to us or misrepresents us or talks behind our back. Someone hits us with their words or their actions. Sometimes they mean to, sometimes they don't, but it, it just cracks us. And if we're, if we're honest, a lot of us, our hearts, our souls look a lot like this. We cover it up really well but a lot of us, this is what we look like on the inside. Something has happened to us. Someone has hurt. Now, I was going to do this live, but then we practiced it and glass shards went everywhere. So front row, we didn't want to hand out safety glasses. So you get the picture, right? I mean, we're all cracked, shattered. And for some of us, it's a crack or two. And you're like, yeah, I can live with it. But there's a lot of us that there are pieces of glass just everywhere. And you think, even if I picked them all back up and glued them all back together, I don't know how this would go back together. I'm just, there's just pain here. I mean, I, there's something about hurt that it, like, it just sticks with us, right? We carry it around whether people know it or not. A lot of us came into church today smiling and happy and how are you? I'm great, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. But this is what it looks like. I've got, I've got moments in my life, like words that people said to me. I, I have a, I've got this vivid memory of a coach in middle school saying words to me in the effect of you're not good enough. And then that set me on this trajectory for the next 20 plus years of trying to prove myself. It's just a shattered piece of me. As a pastor, uh, you may imagine that people have said hurtful things to me and my family. 17 years of leading the church. My favorite is when they will send a note in the mail and not sign it and just tell me how stupid I am. Let me give you a little critique in case you were looking for it, pastor, but I'm not going to give you a name so you can respond to it. Some of our... Uh, closest friends in the world like did holidays and vacation kind of the ride or die friends that you thought man we'll probably be at each other's kids weddings they just exited our life we had conflict about something not even between us about something else and they said we don't believe you I'm sorry about that we were good <laughs> we don't believe you so you carry this around. And man, hurt is severe. We say things like, it felt like I was stabbed in the back with a knife. It felt like the rug was pulled out from under me. I was shattered. I was torn to pieces. We all have experienced betrayal and being abandoned, words, physical abuse, loss, the death. Sometimes it's the words of the people we love the most that hurt the deepest, right? So we're going to talk about that over the next few weeks. A few years ago, I, I went through like this really breaking moment in my life. Like I was, I've talked about this a lot at Journey, and like just shattered. Like I didn't, what I was doing was not working. And I was an empty shell of myself. And I said, I got to do something else. And so I started this whole journey and a new, I went to a new counselor. I've been going to different counselors throughout my life, but I, I started a, a new journey with a new counselor and the, we've met 
almost every week for three years with myself and him and a couple of other guys. But when I first started meeting with him, the very first thing that he did for us, like for me personally, was, was we did an exercise that he called the five most painful experiences of your life. And he said, here, I want you to write down the five or ten most painful experiences of your life. And I thought, well, this is morbid. This is a terrible way to start this. He didn't take my advice. And he said, I want you to do it anyway. And then he said something to the effect of, listen, the only rules are you, you don't have to explain it. It doesn't have to be logical. It doesn't matter if it happened when you were 14 or 4 or 44. Just write down this painful moment of loss, pain, woundedness, experience. And here's what I realized that he was doing is that these painful moments, they have this way. These wounds have this way of wrapping themselves around your heart. And then they shape and guide and become a roadmap for your life. Because... The, these painful moments, they affect how we see each other and, and how they interact with other people, and we carry them around. This, this is nothing new. Jesus said this in John 16, 33, in this world, you will have trouble. I love the honesty of Jesus. Hey, everybody you interact with in a broken world, they're sinners. They've got their stuff. They're trying to carry around. They may not be uh, intentionally hurting you, but they are hurting you. What's Jesus saying? We can't build the wall high enough or thick enough to keep ourselves from being hurt. Every one of us are going to be hurt. How do you deal with that? Well, the first thing that we ought to do is that we, come on, write it down with me, we blow up. It's some of that, that, that's a lot of our reaction. I just, I respond, I react, I want revenge. We fight back, we blow up. Sometimes we don't blow up on the person who hurt us, Right? Sometimes we're like a Coke can. We just get shaken up, shaken up, shaken up, shaken up. And then all of a sudden someone pops the top and poosh. Have you ever had that happen, by the way? Someone blow up on you and you think, what? This is an overreaction to this situation. Like, I don't think I deserve this. And then you come to realize, oh, this isn't about that. This isn't even about me. This is about something you were carrying that you just exploded. Here's another one. Sometimes we just react with, so what? So what? It's not a big deal. Kind of become a doormat. We say things like, well, I probably deserved it, or that's just life. A lot of us men, we were taught, hey, it's not okay to hurt. Don't be weak. Don't be vulnerable. Just shove that down. Just have iron skin. That, nope. They probably didn't mean to do it. And, hey, facts don't care about your feelings. Shove that down. So what? Even if the person didn't intentionally mean to do it, it still, come on, hurt. If someone slams your, your hand in a car door, even if it was an accident, it still what? Hurts. So a lot of times we just go, All right, I got this. Just be tough. So what? But here's where I think a lot of us live with our pain is in quiet desperation. I've met so many people who've experienced so many traumatic moments in their life and so much pain that they just, they shrink into a shell and then they lower, come on, lower their expectations. And they say, there's not really a lot of hope for healing. So I'm just going to settle. Then people say helpful or they think are helpful things like, hey, you know what? You know, time heals everything until you've lived a little bit of time and you know that's a lie. <laughs> because I know a lot of people who are in the last half of their life and the last stages of their life and they're the most bitter people I've ever met. So time does not heal everything. But the good news today is that Jesus can. So the reason why we're talking about this over the next few weeks, and by the way, I say this a lot when we're starting a new teaching series. This is the beginning of the series, not the end of the series. We're not going to talk about everything today. We can't in this few moments together. We're going to start a conversation. 
The reason why we're talking about this over three weeks together as a church is that hurt is a hurdle. I get holds us back. It's a trap. It has the capacity to keep us from experiencing all God wants us to have in our lives and in our relationships. I want you to take a look at this verse with me. In Acts chapter 8, verse 23, some of the disciples, this is after the resurrection of Jesus, and they're traveling from, minis- from town to town doing ministry. And they encounter a man. They have lots of conversation with him. And then Peter, who's very astute, says this, For I... S- go back... For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. See, because I'm I'm watching you and I see that you're full of bitterness, like unresolved hurt, and you're captive to sin. Now, the word he uses there for sin is not the word we normally think of, like I made a mistake or I I, I purposefully disobeyed God or I missed the mark. The word he uses there for sin is the word trespass or injustice. I see that you are captive to someone's wrongdoing in your life. So the reason why we're talking through this series is that hurt is a hurdle and it's a trap and it pulls us back. That's why Paul writes in Ephesians and says this, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. Now, sometimes we teach this passage and we're talking about relationships, and particularly marriage, and, and we'll read that first part and we'll say, hey, in your anger, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Deal with your conflicts before you go to sleep. And I think that's probably some good advice. Although I've been married for 27 years and we've gone to bed angry a lot. Because you realize, hey, it's all going to be here in the morning. And I had a counselor and a mentor say to me at one point, he's like, hey, you're not equipped to deal with this at one o'clock in the morning. Like, just go to bed, go to sleep, wake up the next morning and talk about it. But what he's saying here is don't let this stick around. Don't let the hurt stick around. Deal with it in a timely manner. And then he says this. Why? Because we don't want to give the devil a foothold. What is a foothold? A foothold is a comfortable position. Here's another way to say that is that we begin to hold on to hurt for so long. We don't deal with it in a rapid way. We don't address the issue. We push it down or we dismiss it or we live in quiet desperation. And if we're not careful, we can hold on to hurt so long that it becomes our identity. You know what I mean? Do you ever talk with someone and their pain always seems to rise to the surface? They can't seem to move on because that becomes the excuse. Their pain becomes their identity. Have you ever heard the phrase nursing a grudge? Have you ever heard that? This is a participatory sport, so you can play along. Everybody, you heard it? Okay, good. And you're like, of course we've heard that. Why are you even asking that question? That's kind of dumb. But nursing a grudge, you get it? It's a picture, right, of like a bottle. Like I'm keeping... I'm keeping the grudge alive. I've given it a room in my house to live. I'm nursing the grudge. And what happens when we get stuck in our hurt and we nurse the grudge? A few things. Resentment. Resentment is when we continue to rehearse the offense. We keep reliving it over and over and over again. We bring it back up. We're on a loop. We're stuck. Here's what also happens is sometimes when we're hurt and we're stuck in it, we have this false justification that I can act any way I want toward them or anybody else because I've been hurt. You don't understand. I've been hurt. Also, when we get stuck, we have a great amount of fear because of our hurt. We have a great amount of fear. And so we stop trusting everyone because this one person hurt us. And then... Here's, here's what we do a lot, this is what I do, is I, is I retreat into control. I start building up my wall so that you can't hurt me or no one else. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to organize my life and my relationships in such a way that I become invulnerable, except you just, that's a terrible way to live. Or, or we retreat into numbness. We use every activity under the sun to numb that pain. For a long time, I thought 
that people with addictions were just making choices. I'm like, why are you choosing that? And then I just discovered over a long life of dealing with my own and then dealing with other people's that were just really, in many cases, trying to numb the pain. Whether that's alcohol or drugs or porn or I work too hard or religion or whatever. I just, I'm looking toward all these things so I don't have to feel that. Another big idea today is that when we don't deal with our hurt, it affects our relationship with God. Sometimes we have the idea that I'm okay with God, it's just her. I'm okay with God, it's just them. I'm okay, but Jesus keeps telling us over and over again, like your relationship with God is inextricably linked to your relationship with people. Like you can't separate those things. So today I'm going to give us a first step, some first thoughts toward addressing, dealing with, moving toward healing and our hurt. And here's what I'm going to do. I do this a lot at Journey, okay? So if you're, if you're brand new with us, I'm going to share some things with us that are simple but not easy, okay? Come on. Simple, not easy. We all get this. We all understand this idea. When I was a long, long time ago, a high school football player, I had a coach. I loved him. Back then, coaches yelled at you a lot, um, and so he would come out and he would yell. And he, how many of you grew up in the age where the coach had like these really short coaching shorts on? They were polyester, two buttons right here, put your pockets about right there. Okay. <laughs> big old beer belly, big chaw in, spitting everywhere, grabbing your face mask. He used to say, I want to be an ornament on your face mask. And I'm like, that, I don't know what that means, coach. And. <laughs> But he would just yell and just, yuck, and they never called you by your first name. Priest, what are you doing? This is simple. This is so simple. And I'm looking at him. He's so out of shape. He couldn't run to the end of the field and back <laughs> without having a heart attack. I'm like, it looks simple to you. It was simple. It just wasn't easy. Years ago, I got to go to uh, the Masters. Uh, for when I was living in Georgia, I got to go to a practice round in Augusta. It was beautiful. Guy who invited me loved golf. And I'm not a huge golfer, but I'm like, man, this is a great experience. I'm going to go to the Masters. I'm going to go check it out. So I go with him. I brought one of my interns with me. He was a college baseball player, and we're we're standing there watching the best golfers in the world just strike it, you know. And he was an incredible athlete, this little intern. But he turns to me, never played a round of golf in his life, and he goes. I don't see what's so hard. <laughs> he literally said, the ball's not even moving. And I'm like, I know, man. I know. It's simple, but it's not easy. Did you guys see the quote, by the way, this week? The golfer was asked by the reporter. He said, do you think it's possible to shoot 59 on this course? And he said, have you ever played this course? And he goes, not yet. And he goes, I can tell by your question. Now, it's going to be easy over the next few minutes to dismiss what I'm saying because it, you're, you're going to be tempted to say, but you never played my course. You're going to be tempted to say, but you don't know my situation. And I don't. You could come up here and share it with us, and we would all weep with you because I'm sure. But I want you to put that aside for just a moment, and I want to lean into these simple but not easy ideas. The first one, always the first step to healing, is to acknowledge the hurt. To say out loud, that hurt. There's something about bringing that out into the light that it begins to lose its power. To acknowledge the hurt. Look at this verse with me in Psalms 39. The writer says, so I remained utterly silent. Have you ever done that when you're hurt? Just shut down? Utterly silent. So that I didn't even say anything good. But my anguish increased. My heart grew hot within me. While I meditated, I ruminated, I kept thinking about it. This fire started to burn in me. But then I spoke up with my tongue. I said, this hurts. Several years ago, uh, I was skiing 
and uh, I hadn't been in a long time. You might have heard this, and I was going down a run at Beaver Creek uh, with some of the staff guys and friends, and then I hit a mogul wrong, and I broke my leg. I mean, it was the worst pain I've ever experienced, and uh, tibia plateau fracture. I did the, the slide of shame, you know, where the ski patrol comes to get you, put me in an ambulance, take me to the hospital. I get into the emergency room. I'm just writhing in pain. Now, how silly would it have been when the doctor came in and said, hey, what hurts for me to go, nothing? I'm fine. No, really, I can see like your bone sticking out of your leg. I can tell you're not fine. Everybody around you knows you're not fine. Or, this is what we do sometimes, nothing. Why don't you, why don't you guess? That's what married couples do all the time, by the way. <laughs> What's wrong? Nothing. Uh, we've been together a long time. I know that nothing doesn't mean nothing. By the way, if you're brand new to this thing, when she says nothing, she does not mean nothing. <laughs> but ladies, if he says nothing, he really means it. <laughs> <laughs> what are you thinking about? What are you thinking about right now? The, ma the masters? <laughs> yeah. Anyway. When the, I know this is simple. When the doctor says, where does it hurt? You go, right here. Why? Because it's the first step to healing. This hurts. Somewhere along the way, listen, a lot of, there's a lot of men in our church. Somebody told us it wasn't okay to do that. There's lots of reasons. And you need to be tough and you need to move on and not be too sensitive and whatever. We'll talk about a lot of that stuff through the series. But it's okay to go, that hurt. And then, after we acknowledged it, the very first thing we do is we bring it to God. Even before we take it to the person who hurt us, we bring it to God. I know this is simple. But we bring our hurt, our pain, our wounds, our scars to God. I'm going to give you a couple of examples here. I love this. They're... There are some men who are following Jesus who had the nickname, I love it, the Sons of Thunder. Sounds like a, like a professional wrestling team, right? Like an MMA fighters, they got together. These two brothers, which by the way, just side note, uh, Jesus has all different kinds of people following him. And so these brothers, they're, they're part of the inner circle of Jesus. They walk through a town and they get offended. Some things were said to them, they were rejected. And so what do they do? They bring it to God. They start talking to Jesus about it. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, I love this, they asked, Lord, you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them? <laughs> Did you know that was a prayer you could pray? <laughs> I bet you want to kill them. Uh, this is like a total sidebar, but it's so incredibly comforting to me that these are men who have been following Jesus for like three years, and they go, you want us to kill them? <laughs> Sometimes we think, man, if I could just be up close and personal with Jesus and see his teachings and his miracles, it'd be like the chosen. I'm just living in the chosen. It's amazing. And then you read what they really say, and you're like, oh, they don't get it either. <laughs> and then Jesus says, no. He turned and rebuked them. Then he said to his disciples, hey, let's go to another village. That's a whole other point we could go down in that rabbit hole. But he's saying, let's move on. They bring their hurt to Jesus and he corrects them. Here's another example. Mary and Martha. These are sisters. You might know this story if you grew up around church. Disciples come through, they would often stop in different homes and, and they would stay there and eat a meal. And Mary and Martha were part of the inner circle with Jesus and they're taking care of the disciples. Uh, they, they begin to prepare a meal and then Martha is upset because her sister isn't helping. And then it says this, she came to him, Jesus, and she asked, Lord, don't you care? You ever pray a prayer like that? I do a lot. Don't you care, God, that this has happened to me? That my sister has left me to do all this work by myself. I love this. This is my favorite prayer. Tell her to help me. <laughs> now, you probably don't do this, but sometimes married couples will pray for one another. And it looks something like this. God, you know I'm right. And uh, <laughs> if you would, 
If you would change your heart to understand that I'm right, I would really appreciate that. Tell her. (laughs) Tell him. But then he speaks back and he says, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about so many things. I bring my hurt to God and he gives me perspective. He says, listen, uh, a few things are needed, really only one. And Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken from her. He's, He's leading her down a proper perspective about what's happened. Now, those are maybe minor infringements, cracks. Like, I was offended by these people. Hey, my sister, my spouse, whatever. They're, would you, and then sometimes God course corrects us. But what about when it's real pain? What about when it's something that is just overwhelming emotionally? The great part about bringing it to God is that he understands. I want you to look at this. In John 11, verse 32 Mary and Martha, same people, their brother has died. Jesus was in another city not too far away. He could have come and healed the brother, but he didn't. We know the end of the story, but they didn't. His brother's name was Lazarus. We know the the end of the story that he was raised from the dead, but they didn't. So feel the emotion and the pain, the woundedness, the scar of this moment. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and she saw him, she fell at his feet and said, what is that? Bringing it to God. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. This is not fair. This hurts. Jesus responds, I love it. When he saw her weeping and he saw the people around her, the Jews who had come along with her, they were also weeping. He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And then he said, where have you laid him? And they said, come and see. I love this part. We bring our pain to God. We bring our hurt to God. And he says, let me see. Let me see that. And he walks with them to the place of their deepest pain. And then, shortest verse in the Bible, if you'd like to memorize a verse. Verse number 35, Jesus wept. Now, sometimes we joke about it. That's a short verse. There is so much. Come on. There is so much in these two words. The solidarity of Jesus. I am with you. So many times in the Gospels it says, and Jesus saw them. I I see your pain. So to close out today, and we're going to talk about this a lot more next week. But not only do we acknowledge the hurt and bring it to God, but we, we also have to deal with the root. Like, why does this hurt so bad? Where is this coming from? Why does it sting so bad? Look at this verse, Hebrews 12, 15. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. He says roots of bitterness can begin to grow up in us when we don't deal with our pain. And what do roots do? They ground you. They don't let you move Forward, why does this hurt so bad? I think one of those reasons, and we're going to talk about this more in the next couple of weeks, is because the person wielding the hammer was somebody that we loved, somebody we trusted. Why do the deepest hurts and wounds, why, where do they, they come from the people that we love the most? our ex-wife. And when I'm just like really well aware today that when you came in here, when I started talking about all this, you got quiet because when you, what you see is your ex-wife with the hammer. What you see is your business partner. What you see is your dad. You're like, I cannot believe you did that. So, Next week, we're going to talk about the other person. We're going to talk about those jokers. We're going to talk about addressing the pain. We're going to talk about what it looks like to step forward into that. Because listen, this is so, you got to hear this. Healthy healing is hard. It's a process. Sometimes we're stuck in the pain of our past because we're unwilling to endure the pain of healing. Often, 
when we're going through something difficult, people will say to us, hey, you need to lean into the sovereignty of God. Like, this happened for a reason. It's all going to turn out in the end. And I've thought to myself many times, that is true. But in the midst of that reeling, unfair pain, the death of someone that we love so dearly, or wounds that words have shattered us, like sometimes, this is just my experience, sometimes that falls short. And what I lean into in the moments of blinding pain is not necessarily the sovereignty of God, but, the, but solidarity with Jesus. Like I get those things intellectually, that God is working out a plan. I don't see it, but I get it. But what I need for the comfort of the healing of my pain is that I am connected to Jesus. Because Jesus understands. Jesus misunderstood. Jesus cursed. Jesus yelled at. Jesus lied about. Jesus manipulated. Jesus misrepresented. Jesus dismissed. Jesus betrayed. Come on, anybody carry those feelings in with them today? Jesus abandoned. Jesus abused. Jesus murdered. So there's something about all throughout the Gospels and in the New Testament that keep pointing us toward this suffering Savior. That Hebrews 4.15 says we don't have a high priest, a Messiah, a Savior who cannot empathize with our weakness because he has carried all of these things. So today, we're just getting started with saying, I'm hurt. You don't have to explain it to anybody. Other people don't even under, have to understand why it hurt. It hurt. And I'm going to bring it to God. And I'm going to start to do some work on where the roots of that are. Why? Because listen, I didn't cause it. You don't deserve this. You didn't cause it. It's not your fault. But I am responsible for it. By the power of Jesus, by the authority of his word, like, I'm going to move on from this. Healing is possible. I didn't cause it. I didn't look for it. I had no say in it. But I am responsible for my healing. I'm going to take my steps toward that. And that's what we'll talk about next week. Let's pray. So whether you're in Overflow, Castle Pines, Parker, Highlands Ranch, listening online, I want you to bow your heads and pray in this moment. Maybe you've done this one million times, but today you would just say quietly before God, I'm hurt. This hurts. And then you would just bring it to him. Maybe it's the name of a person. Maybe it's a situation. Maybe it was words that were said to you. Just to say, God, here it is. This hurts. Will you help me find healing? Maybe you're here today and it might even be your first time and you say, I need to bring my hurt and my pain, but I also need to bring my whole life to Jesus. I need to start following Jesus. Maybe God's been calling you. And you've been feeling this sense of, I need to become a Christian. I need to start following Jesus. And if that's you, I want to give you a moment to do that. A moment to do some business with God. And maybe you would say something quietly like this. Just say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you lived for me. You died on a cross for my sin. You rose from the grave. And the best way I know how, I'm just asking you to come into my life. Forgive me of everything I've done wrong. Set me on a new path. Help me start following you. I surrender to you. I trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.